gives this talk today on the Eucharist and its presence. Allow us to all hear Father Don's words and to see you speaking through him, to understand the complex nature of the Eucharist, while also recognizing your presence in its body. And this we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our So a brief introduction into who Father Don is and some of his accomplishments. Father Don is a Dominican priest, teacher, lecturer, and author. He has published many articles and 10 books in the areas of Christology and Christian spirituality. His most recent book was Fire of Love, Encountering the Holy Spirit. He has taught, lectured, and given retreats in Asia, Africa, and throughout North America. He was previously a provincial for the Dominican Friars of the Central Province, as well as president of the Dominican Leadership Conference. Father Don has many more accomplishments, but for the sake of time, um, I will end it there and give Father Don uh, a round of applause to introduce him. Thank you. <laughs> Is this one working then? Okay. Well, here we are. Well, uh, I was asked to approach the topic of Eucharist because this is a year when we are celebrating Eucharistic renewal. But it's also an important year with respect to Thomas Aquinas. It's the 800th anniversary of Aquinas' birth, the 750th anniversary of his death, and late last year, the 700th anniversary of his canonization. So I thought what we would do is kind of look at the Eucharist through the glasses and lens of St. Thomas Aquinas, for the most part. So, Eucharist as presence but also as gratitude and also as gift. Those would be the three areas, but grounded in this notion of the Eucharist as presence. Now why that, first of all? How are you, in terms of being present to someone, how present are we? I can recall a friend of mine, deceased, a Dominican sister, years ago, when a friar and I were going to visit at the school where she was teaching, and the friend of mine, the friar, was rather down, having a very bad day. And we walked in, and she was there, and when we left, my friend the friar was in a totally different mood, and he said, how could you not feel good when you were in her presence. There is something we've all had experiences, I think, when we were in someone's presence and they were present to us, or they were there, but they weren't really present. You don't know what was going on in their mind. So the importance of presence in our lives. But along that same line, when we think of the importance of presence in that way, 
stop and ponder today so often people will talk about living in the present moment being here now at this time and not just living in the past or not just planning the future but actually being able to enjoy the present moment so that's as a kind of starting point how does the Eucharist fit into that now I don't know how much background you have with respect to Thomas Aquinas some of you probably know quite a bit about him. Some of you maybe have never read anything of his. But he is a scholar in the 13th century. He's probably best known for a lot of his philosophical works, philosophical theology, commentaries on scripture, commentaries on the works of Aristotle, many things like that. But uh, his most mature work, you may have heard of, it was known as the Summa Theologiae. In other words, really a summary, the heights, the synthesis of all of theology. And it was a kind of literary genre. Others were writing somas. He even had written an earlier soma, the Soma Contra Gentiles. But this was the last major work of his life, in which as a mature man, he brought together all of theology in a kind of systematic way. And it was organized into three volumes. So that people have often asked the question, well, what is it that structures that? Well, why is it in that way? How did he decide to organize it? The first volume has to do with God, then creation, the human person, this kind of thing. And the most common way of speaking today that people would say is it kind of follows what was known as an exitus reditus theme. Exit coming from, everything coming from God, God and creation and all of creation coming from God, and then it's all returning to God. So that's the most common way they would say he might have seen how to structure it. I would like to propose, however, a different way in terms of the three volumes, or the three parts, really, we should say. Uh, and for me, that structure would be the theme of presence. In other words, in the first part, you're talking about the presence of God in all things. In the second part, you're talking about the presence of God in a unique way in the human being. So all of creation. In the second, the human being. And the third part has to do with Jesus Christ and the unique presence of God in Christ himself. So in that sense, there's a buildup in terms of what we could say are three or even four, but primarily three different kinds of presence. And for us to appreciate those, so we're going to begin by going through all of them and just getting a feel for them. So the first kind of presence in the first part of the Summa is God's presence in everything, and only presence, everywhere. In fact, each part of the Soma is subdivided into a lot of questions or treatises, and the eighth one in the first part of the Soma asks that question, whether God is present in all things. And of course, his answer is yes, and we were maybe familiar with that. But to absorb what that means, that God, whether you look at the heavens or the earth, the stars or the planets, the mountains or the rocks, or tulips in your garden or whatever, that there is a way in which God is present in everything. Some people will speak about that notion as like the earth, creation, as being kind of drenched in God. Now that doesn't mean anything pantheistic, clearly God is other than creation, but another word that's very significant for Aquinas is the word participation. That is, all, everything participates in the life of God. And Aquinas will even talk about three different ways, which aren't so important for us this evening, three different ways in which God is present in everything. And so God is present to all in such a way that in fact if God weren't present, what? It wouldn't be. That God is what brings it into being, sustains it in being, and it's only 
is that apart from God, there would be nothing. So for us to just pause for a moment to kind of absorb the significance of that. In our day and age, when we're ecologically conscious, when we have a certain awareness of the universe and the importance of that universe, to think of it as also God's presence, where God can be found in everything. There's a certain beauty to it, to be able to stand and ponder, to contemplate something, like poets and the psalmist will also say, all of creation gives glory to God. St. Paul in the, first, in the letter to the Romans in the first couple chapters talks about how all of creation in a sense reminds us of God, that we should be able in a way to ponder anything, even whether it's telescopically or microscopically, it, electrons, protons, whatever, that, that God is present everywhere. Now in this first kind of presence, God's presence in all things, there's, not, there's a certain hierarchy also of how God is present in all things. There are different kinds of presence. We'll talk about those. This is God's only presence. But by hierarchy, God is more present in something that's living than in just the rock or the sand by the seashore. God is present in everything, but even more present in those things that are alive. In other words, there's more of God's presence to them, more of what reflects God, the living reality, whether it's the rose, the tulip, the botanical gardens, the tomatoes or the cucumbers or whatever, that there's more, but there's even more, God is even more present or those realities more deeply participate in God insofar as they're not only living, but they're also what we might call sentient beings, the animal world. They have the ability to move, even in the higher animals, a certain kind of psychic life. So we can see almost today, we could say in an evolutionary way, but for Aquinas, you wouldn't have looked at it that way, but there was that hierarchy of ways. And then, if we think of God's presence, even in inanimate, but then in the living, and then in the animal or sentient world, the highest point where God is most present in creation is the human person. In other words, God is present in us in a very profound way that leads Aquinas to talk about his presence in us as if we are created, all of this has been created, but we are created in the image and likeness of God, which goes back, of course, to the book of Genesis. So that you and I are created in some ways, hard to believe, but in some way we are like God, or although when we speak of the image and likeness of God, Tradition would often distinguish those two, that we've been created in the image of God, but we are to become more and more like God. In other words, in our living, in our spiritual lives, we are to become more like God. Now, something to emphasize at this point is to say that the human person that we're talking about, all of us here, created you know, as images of God, that we are still at this point a part of nature. It's an important thing because many of you are scientists and the tendency of modern science is often to think that there's us, the subjective human world, and there's it. That is the objective world out there that we study as if we're not a part of that world. But what Aquinas is saying is that all of this world of nature, this natural world, we are a part of nature. So that I am in this universe, and the universe is in me, and the universe and I are inseparable, distinguishable, 
we have a certain climactic moment in that hierarchy of omnipresence, but nevertheless, we are a part of nature, you know, uh, not apart from it. We are a part of this planet, a part of our world. We belong on the earth. We are earthlings. We are part of it, not apart from it. Even though we have a distinguished, distinctive presence in that universe. Okay, hopefully so far so good. We just got to question eight of the first part of the Soma, over which there are more than a hundred questions and still more parts of the Soma to go. That's all one way in which God is present. He sustains us in being, we participate in his life, and the more we participate in it, the more like God we are. But then if one goes to the second part of the Soma, there's a totally different kind of presence there. A different kind that Aquinas will already refer to in the first one, and that is God's presence in us, but not insofar as we are part of nature, not insofar as we're simply images and likenesses of God, but because of what is called often the life of sanctifying grace, or the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, God is present to us in now a completely different kind of way. We could say more about that life of grace and later in questions or something we could come back to it, but he deals with that in the questions. Actually, the second part is divided into two parts, the first part and the second part, the second part and the second part, and it's towards the end of the first part that he's talking about the Holy Spirit and grace in that kind of way. But it's a different kind of presence now. It's what we might think of as our supernature, as something supernatural. It's not a part of our nature. It's not as we were created but as we were created as images of God and to be like God, but because of then the whole history of sin and everything else, God chose to enter into our lives in a way that even recreates us. It's kind of like new creation, new creatures. We are now to be like God because we've been given, let's emphasize at this point, <clears throat> because we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. An incredible gift that often I think we as Catholics don't fully appreciate. But uh, if we ponder in baptism, we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in Scripture, especially at the Gospel of Luke, but also John, John the Baptist will often say, I baptized with water, but what? He will baptize you with water and the Holy Spirit. Something new has entered into our lives beyond simply who we are as creatures, beyond simply our basic core human nature, and that is the gift of God himself. And the impact of that gift is that we are like new creatures. And so that this gift of sanctifying grace, that grace which Aquinas would speak about it as a grace which makes us pleasing to God, because it, that grace is often referred to as my second nature. It's not the nature with which I was created, but it is like I'm a new person. When I stop and think about the impact of that gift of the Holy Spirit and what it means. In fact, of course, Aquinas is basically a biblical theologian, although best known, I suppose, as a philosophical theologian. But also, if you were to go and read uh, St. Paul again, uh, but in say, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, around verses 16, 17, St. Paul says to us, you are God's temple because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You are God's temple and God's temple is holy and that temple you are. We probably would say on a true-false test that we believe that because it's Catholic teaching, but I'm not so sure how much we really do believe it. 
In other words, the whole notion is just that word temple. In Roman pagan times, temple referred basically to an open space that the diviner or the augur could, could determine the will of the gods, throw the dice, the feathers of the chicken, whatever it would be, should Caesar go to war or not go to war. The reality is that was the templum. Then in Judaism, the temple, in a similar way but very different, was the temple in Jerusalem where the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, uh, is held, and therefore the temple was always that arena, that space within which one found God's intimate presence to the people. In the Gospel of John, it's not so much what is the temple, although Jesus certainly totally respects the temple, makes pilgrimages to the temple, uh, but the temple in the Gospel of John is not so much what, but who? Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. It's Jesus who is the temple. In other words, the one in whom we find God present among us. But for St. Paul, it's a very amazing, incredible, unbelievable kind of thing because St. Paul says what? You are God's temple because God dwells in you. That I am one in whom God, triune God, really actually is present. And God's temple is holy. And that temple we are. We might come back to that notion because it can radically change how we see one another. If I actually see you as not just this person, that person, or the one who annoys me all the time, or the one who whatever, but as someone in whom God is present in this distinctive and unique kind of way. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there is one kind of presence, God's presence in everything, even if more so in some things than others and most in the human person. But then in the human person, there's a totally different kind of presence Namely, God's life, the divine life. As the letter of Peter says, we are partakers of the divine nature. I like to say the difference between Jesus and us isn't that he's divine and I'm not. The difference is really that I'm a sinner and he ain't or wasn't. In other words, we too, through sanctif what is sanctifying grace, partaking of the divine nature, participating in the divine life. The divine life is alive within us. Okay, if we go then to the third part of the Summa, there's another distinctive kind of presence, and that is God's presence in Jesus Christ. The third part is to do with Jesus Christ and the sacraments, Christology. In other words, we can see the kind of buildup. God's presence in everything, God's distinctive and unique way of being present through the gift of the Holy Spirit and sanctified grace in us, but then in one of us, namely Jesus of the Nazareth, God is present in a very different way because Jesus is God by nature. We aren't gods, which is small g, by nature, but we are by grace, even though that may sound odd, because we participate in the divine nature, but I'm not by nature divine, the language often used is we are adopted sons and daughters of God, whereas Jesus is the natural son of God. So Jesus is God, but we are called to be more and more like God, and because of that gift of sanctifying grace, we actually do live and partake, participate in the divine life. Well, we could say more about that particular kind of presence, but just to stand back and see how Aquinas appreciates this notion of God's presence, how the universe itself is just soaked in God, and how you and I have been gifted to be homes for the Trinity itself who lives within us and how we are brothers and sisters 
of that unique creature, Jesus of Nazareth, who is divine by nature, but one who is also fully, totally human. This may raise questions or not. We can always come back to that later. All right. So three kinds of presence. Each, not degrees. These aren't degrees. These are totally different kinds of ways in which God is present. But in that third one, when we think about Jesus Christ, Aquinas will talk about grace. Is there grace in Jesus Christ? And he will talk about three kinds of grace in Christ. The first is just the grace of what traditionally was called the hypostatic union. That is the union of the two natures in the one person. The grace of that union, which was a gift for Christ himself. But the other is also that there is in the human nature of Christ sanctifying grace also. Because if there weren't any, he wouldn't be fully human. And so there's an overflow of his divine nature into his humanity. And so that is, and then there's an overflow of that sanctifying grace into the life of the sacraments. When we think about, we'll get to the Eucharist in a moment, uh, we'll eventually get there. In other words, the Eucharist is the overflowing of the grace that is there in the humanity of Christ and because it's there in such fullness, it's almost like another mystic in the 14th century would use the language, like if you let water come to a boil, eventually it'll boil over. And so it's kind of like that. The grace is boiling there, if you will, in the humanity of Christ, and it boils over and comes to us through the sacramental life of the church. So there's a distinctive way then in which that third kind of grace is present in the Eucharist. The Eucharistic presence, the real presence, although all of these are really present, God is present in the whole universe throughout the planet. God's really present in us. The life of the Trinity lives within us. But there's a unique kind of reality to God's presence, or in this case, let's say, the presence of the risen Christ under what appears to be bread and wine, but in fact is not bread and wine, but in fact is Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, the only Christ there is now, which would be the risen Christ, the presence of the risen Christ, in the well, how can that be? That sounds maybe not to you. Many of you, some of you were at Eucharistic adoration this afternoon, or at other times you do, but it's not unusual to think that we don't always just see God's presence everywhere. We don't always recognize God's presence in, in Father Steve. We should, but we don't always. Um, <laughs> And so even there, although it looks like bread and wine, the reality is, this is Jesus Christ present here among us now. Christ making himself present. I'm going to stop with that notion for a moment about presence. But to be aware that Christ is desiring to be here, now, with us, present until the end of times, and chose this way, in a unique way, to continue to be with us. We'll come back to some of that, but I'd like to talk next a little about the Eucharist from the vantage point of gratitude. Because if Christ is present there, you ought to be grateful. I assume you wouldn't be here this evening if uh, you didn't go to Mass, if you weren't church-going folk. You know, how much, how little, I don't know. But why do you go to Mass? 
Well, we're followers of Christ, we're disciples of Christ. Um, so basically, I'd say we do it because Christ said, do this in memory of me. And so early on, followers of Christ after the resurrection gathered, first in homes, to hear some of the readings of the scriptures and the breaking of the bread. So they gathered and did what Christ had asked them to do. And so through the centuries, the way of doing it might have changed, but, but we still gather in that same kind of way. But it's important to realize that the Eucharist that we celebrate is at its core a prayer of thanksgiving an act of thanksgiving. The word Eucharist, the Greek word Eucharistain, means to thank. So why do we come to Mass? Ultimately, it's not because I have to go, it's because we want to go, but we want to go because we want to say thank you to God for all that God has done for us, all that Christ has done for us. It's that Eucharistic prayer. So at Mass, you have the liturgy of the Word, where you kind of recount some events from salvation history. You know, you hear the proclamation of the gospel, but then once it moves into the second, the Eucharistic prayer itself, that is a prayer of thanksgiving, which has distinct parts to it. So, what does it mean there to give God thanks, to give Christ thanks, for being present to us in this incredibly unique and miraculous way. Well, appreciate that in one way or another. I'm going to the next couple minutes, kind of do a little experiment with you in terms of a meditation. But to shift in order to do that, uh, you may recall, I'm sure you all do recall, from the last chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 21, after the resurrection, uh, Jesus appears to Peter, and Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Now that's a painful and significant moment. The last time they encountered each other, Peter said, I don't know him. Peter denied him. But now this is a new opportunity, and Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus says the second time, Peter, do you love me? And he says, doesn't he believe me because of what's happened before? Yes, Lord, you know that I love Peter, do you love me? Third time, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So for a second, I just want to stop maybe 30 seconds of quiet. I want you to put yourself in Peter's shoes and to just hear Christ, kind of in a meditative, close your eyes and wake, and just hear Christ ask you, Brent, do you love me? Jane, do you love me? Joel, do you love me? And to hear your response, do you love him? Do you love me? And I'm sure, in your own way, somewhere in your heart or mind, you've all said, yes, Lord, I love you. I may not know exactly what that always means, and it may not always be how it appears, but yes, Lord, I love you. Now, in this dialogue, I want us to switch it around for a moment, because gratitude is always a two-way street. I say to you, thank you for being here tonight. And not that you're going to say anything in particular, but by your response, you show some appreciation or acceptance of the fact that you, you appreciate. I said thank you for being here tonight. And, uh, and so, likewise in this little scenario with Peter, next we're going to have a meditative moment in which after you said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, ask him the question. Lord, do you love me? I love you. I just told her I love you. Do you love me? 
And in your own way, in your innermost somewhere, here or sense the Lord saying, yes, of course, you know that I love you. I know that you love me. And of course, I love you. So let us take a couple moments of quiet and just ask Christ that question. Christ, do you love me? Given who I am and given all that I've done or not done, Christ, do you love me? And interiorize his response. this two-way thing going. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And incredible. I know that you love me. Let's come back now to gratitude. We come to the Eucharist. We come there to say to Christ, to God, uh, thank you for all that you've done. It's a two-way street again. So let's change it and hear Christ say to us, we're saying to Christ, thank you for being here. You're there real on the altar. It looks like bread and wine, but I know it's you, you're here. But now hear Christ say to you, you just said thank you to Christ for being here. Hear Christ say to you, thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here at Mass. Thank you for coming to say thanks. I appreciate the fact it's a two-way thing again. Do you kind of get that sense that I come to Mass to thank God for all that he's done? And God responds, Christ responds, I'm only too happy to be here on the altar but thank you for being here also. That sense of mutuality, of reciprocity, of mutual presence. We are present to Christ. Christ is present to us. Christ just made himself present in the Eucharist and the sacrifice on the altar. We're grateful for that, but then we also, over and above it, hear Christ saying, Thank you for coming. Now, what is it though? So, Eucharist is an expression of gratitude whereby there's this mutual presence to each other. Christ is present. We're present. We're happy. We say thank you. He says thank you for being here. Uh, what is it that actually happens there that makes Christ present? Uh, you may think, many of us do, that what makes Christ present is uh, the priest. He has the power, he does it, performs his miracle, and Christ is there. It's not actually the case. It's true, the priest has the power, but what does the priest really do at Mass if we're attentive to it? The priest really calls upon the Holy Spirit. Technically, the word is epiclesis, an invocation of the Holy Spirit. And just to bring the point, you could go to almost all the Eucharistic prayers, but I'll just read what you're very familiar with. You'll hear the priest say, this is from the second Eucharistic prayer. You could go to the third, the fourth, or one of the others. It's less explicit in the first one, but the priest is saying, after Sancta, Sancta, Sancta. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Holy Spirit upon them, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. What the priest is doing is asking the Holy Spirit. And because of our faith, and because of the power entrusted to the priest, 
that we believe and know that when he prays and asks the Holy Spirit, now, you might think, well, that's a rather amazing thing. It is a rather amazing thing, but the Holy Spirit does amazing things. If we go back to the book of Genesis, it's already the Spirit hovers over the creation, veni creator spiritus. There'd be no creation if there weren't the Holy Spirit. Likewise, Jesus Christ, there'd be no Jesus Christ conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so also when we come to celebrate Mass, the Holy Spirit comes once again to transform what looks like what was bread and wine, but is now something else. It's now the real presence in this distinctive way of the body and blood of Christ, of the risen Christ. But that's not all. So he invokes the Holy Spirit. Then when the priest says the words of institution, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood, we now know that it's Christ there on the altar. Well, that's it. It's, it's kind of, that's what we came for, and there it is. But after that, those words of institution, the priest prays another prayer, another invocation of the Holy Spirit, which you've heard 10,000 times, well, maybe you're not old enough for 10,000, <laughs> where the priest says, humbly we pray, that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. And so what? It's not just that the Holy Spirit comes to transform this bread and wine, but once we have Christ really present there, by which we will be nourished, what? Then the Holy Spirit is invoked and asked to come to what? transform us into being the body of Christ. Well, that's rather significant that we become the mystical body of Christ. We already are the mystical body of Christ, but we're deepened, renewed, reminded, made more aware, whatever it might be. Now, and that's where a couple mystics, Dominicans, Eckhart Tolle or others in the 14th century, but it goes even back to St. Augustine, will talk about what they call the threefold birth of Christ. In fact, in an Advent service sermon, John Toller in the 14th century talked about the threefold birth. Uh, the first is how Christ is begotten within the triune life, the only begotten one. But then Christ is born, not in eternity, the eternal word, but born among us in history from Mary, the historical birth of Jesus of Nazareth. But then the third birth is Christ being born in us today. Christ being born. So Christmas isn't just a celebration of something that happened 2,000 years ago, but something that should be happening now. Christ is born in us, in our hearts and souls today. And then, uh, Tyler will ask the question, of these three, this is where it might get a little iffy, and you might wonder, but uh, you might not agree, or you might agree, but of these three, which is the most important? The eternal word's birth in the Trinity? The eternal word's birth historically as the word incarnate in time? Or the word coming alive in you? And he would say, what good is it? If the word was born once in history, if it didn't make a damn bit of difference, if he's not born among us today, if he doesn't somehow transform us, in other words, that transformation of us, which is also to be executed through the celebration of the Eucharist, whereby we receive the body and blood of Christ, but Christ is there for us so that we might be transformed. So we come and we say, thank you, Lord, for being here. And he says, no, no, thank you for coming and being here. Because it's important also for you to be here 
so that you can be renewed, reminded, transformed, that we become the body of Christ, not in the same way that that is the body, that's the sacramental body. We are the mystical body, but we are made that body of Christ through our reception of Holy Communion, through our reception of the Eucharist. So that's a very important awareness for our stand, that when we come, however we come, whether sinners, weak, frail, doubting human beings, whatever it might be, hopefully when we leave Mass, we aren't the same selfish, greedy, you know, gossipy, unkind, hate-mongering, divisive people that we were when we came. Hopefully when we leave, we're aware that what? We now, and that at the end of Mass, the priest says, go, the Mass is ended. I've been here for you. If you've really participated in this, your life has been changed, and now when you go back into the world, you are renewed or are new, and you should be there in the world in a new kind of way. That's why I came to be here, because I wanted to be with you so that you could carry my message out into the world. And so the importance in that sense of the Eucharist, not only is that presence, that real presence, but our presence to each other, and as an act of gratitude, but also an acknowledgement of the gift that the Eucharist is. The gift that the Holy Spirit was given to us even in our baptism, but that now Christ himself has given himself once again to us and we receive that gift. We partake of that gift. So, where are we? We're in a universe, vast, expanding cosmos, on a planet drenched in God. If only we could see it. Most people don't. But it's drenched in God. But that God has given each of us the gift of himself to come and live within each of us so that I am an abode, a temple, for the Trinity itself. But because of that, needing to have that reinforced, renewed, Christ wanting to say to us, I'm not going to just let that be. I am going to be with you till the end of time. Thank you, Lord, for being here. No, no, thank you for being here. No, Lord, thank you because of this gift that you've given us and this awareness now of who I am, that I'm not who I thought I was. Yes, I have a human nature. Yes, I am a human being. Yes, I am a baptized person. But now I am aware I'm a member of a body. We could say a lot more about that, but I'm going to have to stop so you have some time for questions or whatever, or suggestions. But to just say that that whole notion of the body of Christ, if you go and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, his great image, we are the body of Christ, that that is also a real thing. It's not just what we're like the body of Christ, but we are the body of Christ. And we are members of it. That we are one in Christ. And in Romans chapter 12 verse 5, he says it even more succinctly, more briefly, wrote Romans after Corinthians, but in Romans he'll say, not only are we members of Christ, but we are members of one another. We ain't who we are apart from each other. Modern physics likes to talk about how everything's entangled. You know, well, as St. Paul said long ago, at least among us, we're all entangled with each other. And just as the eye can't say to the ear, 
you know, what good are you? You can't see anything in the ear, you can't say to the nose, what good are you? You can't hear anything. What? We are all there as Christ's body. So to simply sometime, maybe before adoration or during Mass or alone in your room, just ponder the great gift that this is, that the Eucharist is, that we're given this opportunity to say thank you because of the way in which this kind of presence is there for us to reform, transfigure, and transform us. Well, let us take just maybe a minute of quiet to kind of pull together what is it that uh, you might find valuable, and if anything, in what I've said, and then we'll take opportunity for you to ask some questions or share something. So we'll just take a minute of quiet for you to ponder and then we'll anyone needs to lead at any point, feel free to do so. Uh, but this is an opportunity for you to share some insight of your own or some thought, but also to raise a question. doesn't have to be a question, can be a question. If you don't raise any, I'll ask you some. <laughs> or I'll tell you stories about Father Tom. <laughs> thought that goes through your mind uh, uh, yeah just speak loudly it probably should work without the mic certainly how does God revealing his presence through Eucharistic miracles so the kinds that have been proven scientifically in a worldly way that we can understand how does God's revelation of his presence in Eucharistic miracles inform our belief in the real presence of the Eucharist that we receive mm -hmm. at Mass those miracles are not common, but common enough. I mean, they have happened, but it would be another way, I would say, in which God simply chooses to support, undergird your tendency toward unbelief. In other words, we today certainly live in a world of unbelief. Uh, an age of unbelief, a secular age. And I think we sometimes underestimate the impact of living in a world that really is indifferent to religion, sometimes even hostile, certainly not always a believing world. And so there are ways at times, just like you could speak about Marian apparitions, you know. In one sense, we could say that the more you grow in your Christian life, that somehow Mary will become more and more real to you, but that doesn't mean she's going to appear to you in the same kind of way, but every time she did appear, the person never expected that. Or, you know, so there are other ways in which God at times will find ways to manifest his only presence or his presence in us or in the Eucharist. It's interesting, you know, Thomas Aquinas will raise the question, uh, it's a little bit too esoteric or specific, but like say, uh, in a cross where you find blood flowing from it, or even the Eucharist, is that the actual blood 
of Christ, and he'll say, no, it's actual blood flowing, and it is miraculous, but it isn't necessarily the blood of the earthly Jesus. So it is blood manifesting itself, you know, so that we can see there's a miracle going on, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily always the, uh, because what is present in the Eucharist and for us is the risen Christ. We always have to keep that in mind. Okay, other thoughts? Uh, or yes, just speak loudly, I think it'll be. Spirit, and through the power of God, of course, uh, invokes the Holy Spirit to it. And so my question is, when you speak to the Eucharist, let's say, adoration, and you may hear something back, uh, who and which one are you speaking to? You mean, when you ask who, are you, is it God, or is it Christ? Is that kind of your question? Or? Yeah. Uh, the Holy Spirit, oh, Jesus, okay. or the Lord. And I know they're all one, I'm which one, but they are truly separate. Uh, yes, I think the best answer to that is to say it is God as triune, it is the Trinity, you know, but it's true that sometimes we associate or appropriate one thing more with one of the persons of the Trinity, but like when we think of creation, uh, who creates the universe? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything came to be. So it sounds like Christ is the creator. On the other hand, I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. On the other hand, veni creator spiritus. So Aquinas would say it's really the Trinity that creates, because where you have one, you always have the others. But it may be much more likely that in the Eucharist, in the way you're speaking, that it would be Christ himself. In other words, that we would associate. But you don't have Christ present apart from the triune life, if that makes sense. But that, and in a way, it makes no difference. You know, so that sometimes I would say apart from the Eucharist, in my own prayer, uh, I would say it's often the Holy Spirit you know, just would be the way I would kind of ponder it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has been given as a gift to me. The Holy Spirit lives in me. Well, that means the Trinity lives within me. But I, I think of it because of the way in which it's spoken about in the scriptures, that, that it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that, that actually, who are we when we leave Mass? But in any time, who are we? We are called to be instruments of the Holy Spirit. There was the... Uh, Russian Orthodox saint in the 19th century, uh, Saint Seraphim of Serov, who was once asked, uh, uh, what is the real meaning of the Christian life? What's it all about, Alfie, type thing? What, what's the goal of the Christian life? And his response was, to be an instrument of the Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful way. So there are many different ways of kind of sometimes conceptualizing, contemplating, but to think of yourselves as who are you, to be able to say that if you really are deeply immersed in the Spirit, if you go to Mass, if you receive Christ, to think that it is now not I, but the Holy Spirit who lives in me. Not with a sense of pride, you know, which can easily get in the way. No, no. Holy Spirit, I want you to know. No, but to be able, genuinely and humbly, to be able to say, it is now not my I, it is now not my ego, it is now not that false self, but it is the Holy Spirit who lives in those. But you could also say, what? It is now not I, but Christ who lives in me. That would be a more common expression in St. Paul, but in St. Paul there's really no difference as such between whether you're in Christ or in the Spirit. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, and basically you're in all three. You're in the triune 
God. But sometimes, so when you come to Mass, because it's the presence of the risen Christ, you're much more conscious that it's Christ with whom you are in dialogue. But in many other situations, you might think of it as Abba, Father, who art in heaven, or you might think of it as the Holy Spirit. It depends upon how God chooses to act in your life when God calls you to be in Christ as we are called to be. We are the body of Christ. Now it's interesting, we are the body of Christ. We don't speak about ourselves being the body of the Holy Spirit, but you could. But usually one speaks about the Holy Spirit as being the soul of the church. Christ is the body and Christ is the head of the body. Another interesting thing is, uh, you might think of, well, how important are you to Christ? But, uh, you know, just, just like we said, the second epiclesis that we're being made into, that what good is the head without a body? You know, so that the body of Christ is very important. But the Holy Spirit is, Aquinas actually talks about the Holy Spirit as being the heart of the body. But more common tradition is to think of the Holy Spirit as the soul of the church, you know, kind of thing. Okay, other things along that are different kind of line. Otherwise, I'll get to ask questions, I'll pick out. Yes, okay. So why, why is it so important and how does it work that we must be in a state of grace to receive God's grace through the reception of the Holy or through the reception of the Eucharist. The whole mystery of the Christian life, of the Christian life, this will raise a lot of other questions, begins with baptism. And so baptism is like the door through which you enter into being a new creature with this second nature, you're now in Christ, you know, but that doesn't mean you can't deepen your life in Christ, that you can't grow in your life in Christ, but already in baptism, you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean, this is a little complication, that God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, can't act outside of baptized Christians. So someone might say, well, then why get baptized? Because it seems as if God has chosen the way in which he wishes to be present to us is through the sacramental life of the church. That's the preferred direction that it took. God comes incarnate, creates this ecclesial fellowship, and these sacraments are those actions of the Holy Spirit through which we normally would, but that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit can't act outside the sacraments. So the mystery then is that as we continue along the Christian life, if you take the different sacraments, baptism, confirmation is very much the deepening of that life in the Spirit, which we already have, and in the Eastern Church, sometimes those have been combined together. But then the Eucharist is the, as the Vatican Council said, as well as before that, you know, the sum of it all. And so you enter through the door, but you're nourished. You know, another interesting thing to say, it is probably doesn't relate to what you're asking, but when it comes to Aquinas, we think of him as a very philosophical theologian. But he was also a poet. Uh, and uh, those of you who had been at benediction this afternoon, uh, after adoration, you sang Tanta Marigo, uh, which is actually some verses from the Eucharistic hymn Pange Lingua, which was composed by Thomas Aquinas. And that's because Aquinas was invited by Pope Urban IV in the 13th century to compose the liturgy which he didn't do from scratch, obviously, there were a lot of, you know. So he composed the, you know, the O Solitaris Hostia, all of these are parts of that. But then there's the, the other one that 
Dominicans always pray with every time they get together for morning prayer, evening prayer, or oh, sacred banquet in which Christ becomes our food. The memory of his passion is celebrated and a pledge of future glory is given to us. That's basically a prayer that Aquinas wrote a collect for the mass for Corpus Christi, but then used. But it's also then the threefold, again, all sacred banquet in which Christ becomes our food here and now. So he's chosen to be this way to nourish us, to be our food here and now. But the memory of the passion, you know, and St. Paul talks about that, that we remember Christ. So there's the memory in the, of the past, there's the being nourished now in the present, but aware of the pledge of future, that there's the pledge, that future glory is what's going to come. But now you ask, you know, why do I have to be in the state of grace? Uh, it's simply being in the state of grace deepens your receptivity. If I come to you and give you a Christmas present, what the hell is that? Is that all you can afford? <laughs> you know, in other words, unless you're disposed, unless you're receptive, you aren't going to appreciate, you know, and sometimes a gift might be, you know, the widow's might type thing, all, you know. And so being in the state of grace makes us receptive to be more and more deeply graced. We can grow in the life of grace. It's not black or white, all or nothing, you know. But even if we're not in the state of grace, we've been given it, but for some odd reason you foolishly lost it, more sin, uh, what do you do then? You go to confession, in other words. But again, to see all of the sacraments is integrally connected with the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's why I don't know that we often as Catholics fully appreciate the giftedness that this Holy Spirit is. We are baptized in the Spirit, confirmed in the Spirit. We, Christ is made present to us through the power of the Spirit. There'd be no Jesus Christ if it weren't for the, there'd be no scriptures if it weren't the Holy Spirit. There'd be no sacraments, there'd be no church if it weren't the Holy Spirit. You know, and with all of the sacraments, we could go the anointing of the sick, all of them call upon the Holy Spirit, you know, in one way or another. And so likewise at confession, and you know, <clears throat> it's again, the priest prays that the Holy Spirit has been given to us for the forgiveness of sin. You know, which you find again in the 20th chapter, I think it is, the Gospel of John. So anyway, the thing is, I can be more and more disposed to be receptive, just as certainly, as, now certainly, of course, you're a really very mature adult man, but, you know, as we go, if you think of yourself at the age of 10, if you think of yourself at the age of 20, you think of yourself at my age, 25. <laughs> in other words, just as humanly speaking, we grow and mature, so one would expect more of Father Tom, because at his old age, he certainly should have matured <laughs> into being the, you know, the incarnation of sanctifying grace. Well, that's old Tom. <laughs> Anyway, I'm sure some of you here have a vocation to Dominican life, and that would be what also? A working of the Holy Spirit, you know, in your midst. But again, whether it's a vocation to marriage, sacrament of marriage, family life, or to religious life or whatever, all of those are expressions of gratitude. Why would someone, why would Ben over there foolishly waste his life except that he would see it as a as a way of thanking God for how God was active in his life. A married couple, likewise, their family life, they should see that as not just between us, that it's a way in which they live their life as an expression of gratitude to God. Maybe one more, maybe not. Anything else that someone wants to share of profound wisdom? should look around and call upon someone just to embarrass them. But, uh, oh, 
okay, I think you were gonna make an announcement or not. So if that's, we'll bring it to a close. And this fine young man here. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Sometimes I, I don't think I'm that mature. <laughs> we don't either, Sawyer. <laughs> all maturing. Yeah, my final announcement is that this is the last boil well, gathering, everybody, that this group of officers will be doing uh, before the new officers are elected this year. And so I, I just want to thank Jeff, Justine, and Jonah. I had to go early, but thank all of them for helping make this happen. And of course, thank you to Father Tom uh, for helping organize Father Don to come and speak here tonight. Um, my last announcement is just thank you to all of you for coming. Um, it's a truly a blessing to see you here tonight, um, to listen to Father Don about the Eucharist and the Lord's presence in the Eucharist. So thank you. That's all I got. You know, bless. Have a good night. D has something. Yes, we well, yes, going prayer. Um, and I'm going to invite uh, it is my honor to invite Father Don up to close us in prayer and then close us with a blessing. Thank you. Well, let us pray. God of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you thanks and praise for the 10,000 ways in which you've blessed us in our lives, even sometimes blessed us with crosses that we've had to carry, the crosses in the midst of which or through which we come to know and relish your presence and your love. Help us, Lord, to be more deeply aware of your presence everywhere, whether in the flower or the kangaroo. Help us to be aware of your presence in one another, in my brothers, my sisters, in those I like, but also in those I don't like. There you are, in them also. Thank you especially for your presence, so palpable and real, even if only seen through the eyes of faith in the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist. Thank you so much for being here for us, for inviting us to be grateful to you. We now pray, come Holy Spirit, fill us our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls, our spirit with your love. Come with your heavenly grace to heal, transform, sanctify, guide, and strengthen us. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, through Christ to our Heavenly Father, to bless these people, the staff here at St. Tom's, all the students, those who are present tonight, those unable to be present, those in whom the deep desire to know you, love you, and serve you is growing more and more strong day by day. So I ask you to bless them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And thank you for being here.